Well, a very warm welcome to today's Spring Conference. My name's Alf Torrance, and I'm the Executive Director of the RBCC. Today, we have a fantastic event for you, which is called Working Towards a Socially Inclusive Future. The idea behind it is that equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace strengthens business resilience, makes for better decision-making, and ultimately greater profitability. Not a new, new idea by any means, but one that still surprisingly faces its, its challenges. I'd like to first start by thanking our sponsors for making today possible. Unilever, today's lead sponsor, BAT, Shell, and AstraZeneca. And of course, to you, the audience, for joining us today. Before we get started, a short explanation as to how today's event will run. After I finished my short introduction, Stuart Lawson, today's moderator, will take over. I'm sure many of you will want to put questions to the panel. If you do, please use the chat function to do so. The RBCC team will be monitoring it throughout and will try and pick out some of the more popular themes. If you want to ask a question direct to the panel, you're more than welcome, but please use the hand up function on the Zoom, um, um, on the Zoom function and uh, I'll cue you when to ask that question. Please unmute yourself when speaking, and of course, remember to mute yourself again when you've finished. If you're watching the, the live stream on YouTube and want to ask a question or comment, please use the comments section. We will be recording the webinar, which we'll post on our website um, after the event. I hope that's all clear, quite straightforward. Um, Stuart Lawson will be known to many of you, especially if you live in Moscow. Of course, he's a board member of the RBCC, but he's also a senior advisor for financial institutions and government in initiatives in Russia and the CIS for Ernst & Young. Before joining EY in 2011, Stuart spent 16 years as a CEO or chairman of various banks in Russia, including Citibank and HSBC. Among his many other talents is that he lectures at various business schools and is actually a very gifted photographer who's had a couple of books published on Russian ballet and is currently putting together a photography exhibition again on ballet. Stuart, many thanks for uh, taking time out to moderate today. The floor is yours. Alf, uh, thank you very much. I, I think um, it's obvious why, of course, I chose ballet. It's because of the fact that I can participate, uh, not. And actually, I have to say that, um, in a way, I feel in, in the same sort of uh, manner as this uh, in this discussion. Um, I clearly represent the past, um, uh, white Anglo-Saxon male getting on in years uh, with a traditional mindset, let's say. Uh, but the question that, that we're going to deal with today is really all about the future. Um, and I think, certainly from my perspective, um, everybody knows ESG has now become the hot topic. Uh, it's it's uh, something everybody likes to refer to. And within that, uh, this whole concept uh, that we're talking about, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, comes into focus. I think the issue for me, at least, is how does that become real? It's, it's a nice thing to say. It looks good in the annual report. Um, people talk about it. Uh, but, but what we want to uh, investigate today, and we've got a great set of panelists, is how real is that? How do you make that real? so that it, it goes from being something that's uh, uh, a concept to being something that's real. Uh, our panel is fantastic, um, and I feel very, very honored to be amongst uh, this group. Um, we have Elvira Silutina from Unilever, uh, Irina Ashrapova from AstraZeneca, Irina Emoleva from BAT, uh, my colleague Sophia Azizian from EY, and Tamara Zetna from Shell. Uh, a great lineup. Um, I, we have plenty of, uh, of elbow room here. We've got two hours. Um, we'll use it if we need it. And if we finish early, we'll finish early. I hope we need all of it. Um, and I also hope that uh, this becomes a very interactive session and that we can uh, bring in the audience to, to ask some questions. So uh, I'll get out of the way. Um, Elvira, would you like to kick off uh, with your opening thoughts and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Thank you. 
Sure, thank you. Um, I'm very thankful for the honor to represent Unilever uh, during this session. Um, as um, Stuart mentioned, my name is Elvira and I am senior HR consultant uh, in Unilever Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. Um, I lead, lead multiple projects because we went to the new HR agile world and one of the uh, projects which I'm leading is um, equity, diversity and inclusion. So I'm representing our wide um, great team uh, as a product owner for uh, for this session. So um, I would like to share some key thoughts uh, that Unilever has on equity, diversity, and inclusion. I will share the global view and share some local practices. And we'll be very uh, thankful for all the comments, thoughts that you can share in the chat or uh, on YouTube. Let me start with a short presentation to support my speech and Give me a second, I will share my slides. Um, can you see everything? Yeah, and there's a lot to see. Yes, so this is the first slide. I will read uh, everything word by word, which is written here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> of course not. Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> Uh, it would be a nightmare, but I just want to start with the bigger picture and say a couple of words. In Unilever, we have our new planet and social commitments that we revamp recently in 2021. We have, we, we have, as you can see, very holistic plan, very ambitious plan, how we can improve our planet and society together with growing our business. And we have three key elements there, improving health of the planet, planet improving people's health, confidence, and well-being, and contribute to fairer, more socially inclusive world. Um, and we were going to do it internally and externally to the community that we're affecting. And as you can see in this bigger picture, we have a huge pillar, um, which is a part of the first one, equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and what is in this pillar that we can see? Uh, we have a really consistent holistic framework which uh, cover equity, diversity, inclusion for different internal and external elements. First, of course, is talent equity within our organization, which we will talk more about in a second. Uh, then we have our uh, brand-driven equity, where for our brands, uh, we want to show more inclusive products, inclusive branding, and increase amount of diverse group uh, in our advertising in the shot and behind the camera, because it's very weird when if we're shooting the commercial about queer um, uh, people of color, uh, and it's done by white straight cis men. <laughs> so we want we want to avoid that, and uh, through our brands, give, give, uh, drive positive and inclusive messages inside and out. Then we have our supplier equity, where we uh, committed to expand and diversify our external partner pools, and on the global level, by 2025, we commit uh, to spend around two billion dollars. Um, annually on diverse uh, suppliers uh, from minority groups uh, and other diverse suppliers. Uh, and then, of course, is community uh, where we uh, where we will uh, promote our initiatives uh, on fair inclusive inclusiveness for broader uh, community of people. Uh, if we're talking about the talent equality on this pillar, I will spend the rest of uh, the time that I have left, uh, we will talk about equity, diversity, inclusion, where we have our commitments in uh, being fair in our procedures and practices and imply, uh, imply experience and be, uh, so it will be equitable, diverse, and inclusive for whole their employee journey. Uh, then uh, we uh, we're committed to have diverse leadership on all level and also by 2025 with uh, multiple um, international companies we're committed to have five percent of people with disabilities by then to represent uh, the reality of the work which is outside uh, represented inside our organization so uh, let me quickly share with i uh, with you our diverse inclusion journey so far in unilever we started 
it long years, long time ago. I think first we started to speak about it in 2010s, where we have our gender balance declaration that by 2020 we will achieve 50-50% uh, gender balance in leadership which we already did in all leadership levels and management levels. Then we're starting to talk more in 2017 about unstereotyped in the workplace and talking about broader um, diversity, not only gender. And in 2018, uh, we expanded even more with LGBTQI plus agenda and people with disabilities agenda. And 2020 was a very crucial year for us. Uh, and for everyone, I think we know this word, we heard it like a billion of times, like COVID-19, uh, which to be honest, showed us um, a, lot of, um, a lot of internal pressure that we have within uh, diverse inclusion across the world. You know, the things that happened in America um, with police brutality, Me Too movement um, and all other uh, things that COVID showed that there is much more privilege and unfairity and uh, exclusion that we even thought. So uh, right now, um, diversity and inclusion is more important than ever. And we as Unilever understanding that. So we uh, focus on that even more and expanding our understanding of what is diverse inclusion. So we added, uh, so we changed our name within like uh, our projects, within our uh, our agenda. We added another letter. Uh, now it's not DNI, it's EDNI, uh, it's equity. I think some of you heard about this um, term, which becoming more and more popular um, as an extra adding to the agenda. And what is, what is equity uh, for those who may be here in the first time or just a refresher? Uh, we have equality when we're offering same opportunities for everyone, but equity is when we support access to the same opportunities. The easiest example that and I that I can share if uh, is um, recruitment uh, of people with disabilities. It's one thing to have uh, for everyone same recruitment process, but if our, for example, tests or video interviews do not support uh, people with disabilities, for example, like sight, um, uh, sight disabilities or other any type. This is our issue, not, not issue of the candidates. So equity here will be to set, uh, maybe at the first step, set up a procedure, how we can, um, uh, how we can accommodate their disability. Or uh, ideally, in the ideal world, we need to change our system, change our process, so everyone, with uh, no matter their disability or other, um, of other nuances, will have same uh, fair experience uh, through the recruitment process. And through this equity lens, we can look at anything within our organization or in outside world. So. Um, so we are getting our priorities in order where we have our diversity, inclusion and equity. Um, I know those terms are very familiar for you, but just once again to reiterate, we have our diversity where we have uh, understanding that we have diverse group, but it doesn't enough, it's not enough to have a diverse group. This uh, group uh, should feel integrated, should feel belonging and understand, and understand it. So it's inclusion part here. And equity is what we are as an organization getting and doing to get rid of the barriers that we have. So people can stay on the table, join the table, tell their opinions. Um, so, so in the end of the day, uh, using those three big terms, we have our global priorities, strategic diversity pillars. There are four of them. Uh, gender, people with disabilities, LGBTQI+, and race and ethnicity. These from the global lens, uh, what, what Global Unilever uh, ask us to focus on. But locally, there is a lot of different um, nuances, including legislation and also uh, more social um, or like other um, diversity problems. You can see here, um, diversity will, which is showing that diversity is not only what you can see out front uh, within the person, there's a lot of things that um, 
can be there behind it. For example, um, paternity, ethnic representation, education, social background, work background, age, a lot of things. So locally, uh, so locally teams are empowered to decide their own priorities. And in some countries, they even can uh, not go fully aligned with the global priorities due to the local nuances and legislations. So um, if we're talking about our local um, inclusion status, if, if we're talking about diverse inclusion statistics in numbers, let's talk first about gender balance, the one that is uh, very, like, uh, very, uh, very discussed along uh, all, um, all companies on the globe. Uh, as we can see on the global level, we have um, 50, 50.7 percent of managers uh, are women. So this is our like proud achievement that we uh, in 2020 achieved and went like very, very long journey for that. But if we're looking specifically at Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, we're even more above the average. 63.2% uh, of managers are women. And what we're specifically proud of that in the functions like supply chain and sales, which usually, uh, which usually in Russia men dominated functions, we have also a great gender balance um, around 50% or more. Uh, but it's not only like, let's say butterflies and roses uh, in our uh, diverse inclusion world. We also have some challenges and issues. Uh, you can see on the right hand side some also diversity um, inclusion service outputs. Uh, on the first lane, you see uh, that 83% of our people feel that there that is inclusive work environment, and 82% of our people um, see that Unilever has created uh, an environment where people of all diverse uh, backgrounds can succeed. So this is the result of global survey. And we thought it's like too good to be true, to be honest. We still have our issues, but the global survey is showing that everything is green, everything is perfect. So we decided to have our local survey. It's in the blue blob. Some results of it are in the blue boxes in the second lane. So what we're seeing and what we're working on is to be honest, we are not as diverse as we would like because 85% of our employees in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus representing majority in terms of nationality, disability, and sexual orientation. So we can improve our representation within the organization. Then only 40% of the people really knows what does equity, diverse, inclusion mean like by book. Uh, so, uh, which is, um, to be honest, um, not a great state, and we're working on increasing awareness. And 12% uh, of our employees have seen or, in, or experienced discriminated jokes, phrases, and comments. Uh, this number, for me, to be honest, is very bad. I would like to see zero. So uh, I will also share more what we're currently doing to uh, decrease this number to zero uh, and how we're working with biases. Because usually those jokes and phrases are not mean-spirited. Uh, no one is like bullying one another, but usually it's like unconscious bias and unawareness, which sometimes can bring this in the workplace. So after we analyzed all the, um, all the outputs of the surveys, we created uh, recently and refreshed our equity diversity inclusion squad in uh, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. How it's organized. We have 15 people. Uh, most of them are volunteers for businesses and some couple of HR representatives, including myself. So we ask people to raise their hands who want to work on this agenda in the agile way. So we created an agile squad, which we separated in four sub squads and sub streams. Uh, there you can see them in the slides. First sub stream is external. Uh, we're working um, with, uh, with our employees to build inclusive uh, products portfolio. So uh, which, what does it mean by that? That we are focusing on minority groups, like people with disability, migra uh, migrants, and um, pensioners, and currently asking them uh, their feedback to what we can improve in our products uh, for them to be 
uh, appealing and uh, serve their needs and make their life better. Uh, and also ensuring that route to market uh, and everyone can access our products uh, around the Ukraine, um, Russia and Belarus. Then uh, other three squads are internal and focus on the internal communications and internal culture. Is uh, First squad is equity, diversity, inclusion, awareness. Uh, as you saw on the previous slide, not everyone knows in details what, by the way, those three letters means. So we have uh, established this squad that working on the communication campaigns, on boarding trainings, and also we launched recently mandatory unconscious bind training uh, virtual training for everyone in the organization to tackle the issue of um, unconscious bias that can occur at any point of uh, our life, work life or personal life. And we think this is a very, very important thing to do. Then we're working on diversity and representation, mostly on representation, where as we saw, uh, that we would like to increase uh, amount of our employees that have disabilities and board them and help them to build successful careers. So we're starting with the internship, uh, hiring students, uh, building disability recruitment roadmaps and focusing on the career day with people with disabilities. So focus of this year is mostly on people with disabilities. And developing inclusive culture. Uh, this is last what we're working on. Um, it's more about some specific inclusivity topics. So we are hopefully this year will uh, try to assess how it's possible to have some kind of internal inclusion awareness communication on LGBT topics and other topics that uh, are connected with diverse inclusion and some specific group uh, groups, for example, like uh, parents, um, as I said, LGBT and others. And also we will focus on our leadership with diversity uh, inclusive session for our board. But this is our plans, what we already have done, uh, if you are interested and would like to see and share as a practice. We have already done a lot of on disability uh, inclusion where we partnering with um, great uh, NPOs like Perspective and Dayswim. We launched an internal campaign where I Me campaign, which is called Well in Place with Disabilities, were sharing their stories publicly, of course, by their own will, with uh, within the Unilever to raise awareness uh, and uh, bring up very important topic of uh, career building and working with disability. Um, and also, we already established a uh, detailed recruitment process guideline and hiring, man hiring managers training uh, on um, of, for the people with disabilities and done lots of lots of awareness campaigns. Also, we have been focusing last year a lot on parentship. Uh, I think one of the innovative things that we did uh, is uh, paternity leave for our dads. Uh, on the global level. So Unilever is paying uh, one month full paid leave for newly dead, for new dads, which is great for them to bond, to bond with their newborn child. Also for maternity uh, well-being standards uh, were implemented, where on the big sites we established uh, feeding rooms as a mandatory um, element of the office lanes. Maybe it's not as, uh, uh, as needed right now in the COVID world, but uh, at some point it will. And we have uh, maternity leave 100% paid. By government law in Russia, you, they, uh, ladies are paid for like around three months only part of their salary, but Unilever is paying on top, so they will have full uh, maternity leave paid for like three months, not for childcare pay, but maternity and birth pay. Um, and also done career days for uh, parents and their teenage children during the summer times to support their in prof orientation and support parents um, uh, during this uh, important time in their lives. And of course, women talent. Uh, it's not like an accident that we achieved such a great numbers in uh, women um, diversity in leadership. Uh, so uh, what we have done uh, on the global level, we have established leadership and mentoring program programs for women leaders. We made a great partnership with the Google with I'm Remarkable um, workshops where women um, can come together and discuss uh, their like successes to make them more empowered. 
So this is our local practice, which uh, went like global as a best practice. I really recommend you to check it out, those I'm Remarkable workshops. And Unilever Mother's Day, where we are supporting uh, women to share their stories in specific communication campaign, how they're building their careers and being mothers at the same time. And if you follow our um, CEO of Unilever Rap, Regina Kuzmina, in Instagram, I really recommend you to do this. She recently wrote a very great post with um, uh, with photos of her kids where she recently shared her story, how she built her career and uh, at the same time gave birth to two fabulous kids. So um, sharing it's not only internally, but externally. I think that's all from my side. I'm happy to uh, answer questions from the chat. Uh, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am dying to ask a couple of questions of my own, but I'm, I'm going to hold back. Um, I think that uh, it's probably best to do the Q&A session at the end, otherwise it, we, we could end up with just your presentation and a lot of questions uh, and answers to that. So um, if we can move to Irina Ashrapova or from AstraZeneca, um, then we, we'll, we will get to our, uh, questions and answers at the uh, end of the presentations. Um, so over to you, uh, Irina. I think you're on mute. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my slides. Perfectly. Yes. yes okay. Perfect. So uh, I will introduce myself. My name is Irina Shrapova, and uh, I work for AstraZeneca nine years, uh, I would say. And actually, if we are talking about AstraZeneca, this is a global uh, biopharmaceutical company. And uh, we operate uh, also in Russia more than 28 years. And uh, here in Russia, we have a marketing company. We have, uh, uh, we have our plant in Kaluga region. And also we have uh, several R&D projects uh, on Russian territory, uh, also together with um, Skolkova. I, uh, I would say as a global company, we actually try to push the boundaries of the science to, uh, to, to find and to um, deliver a life-changing medicine for our patients. And on the same time, we would like to be uh, a great place to work and uh, a company with a great place to work. And uh, as a, a top employer, uh, we also try to do our best um, uh, to do our best uh, in Russia, also in Russia and uh, implement uh, uh, lots of initiatives in terms of uh, safety, health, and of course, well-being. And I would say that inclusion and diversity is also important topics for us. And uh, talking about inclusive and diversity, I would say that uh, we understand that this is fundamental uh, for, our success, for our success. Uh, uh, we would like, uh, and we know that um, innovation that uh, we that we put into all our medicines requires uh, breakthroughs ideas and these ideas can come only from diverse workforce that's why uh, we uh, also have strategy in terms of inclusion and diversity and uh, and we focus is, uh, uh, and we focus uh, on three areas uh, first of all of course uh, it's about leadership and we uh, empowering inclusive leadership. Uh, it is important to have uh, teams with uh, open minds uh, and uh, who, uh, who, who has uh, uh, intellectual curiosity. Second, uh, it is a uh, focus on building uh, sustained and diverse leadership and talent pipeline. And it is also about the team. It is also uh, about creating uh, the team of many talents uh, uh, that uh, will lead us to our uh, new medicine and to our new future. And also the third, but, the third, but not uh, the last, but not the least, uh, it is of course about uh, fostering the environment of speak up culture. And um, 
uh, here we are focuses uh, on uh, topics that all voices are heard and uh, uh, I, all ideas uh, are matter and everyone, uh, every, everyone in AstraZeneca uh, can make a valuable contribution without any fears. And of course, uh, we, we uh, believe that uh, this commitment uh, is uh, fundamental for our strategy uh, to deliver growth through innovation. And uh, as a, uh, in here in Russia, we also have uh, our definitions uh, of inclusion and diversity. And actually, as a great uh, and, and as a top employer, we uh, try to create a learning environment that uh, uh, that um, help our people uh, to understand themselves, that support uh, the uh, culture of diversity, uh, the culture uh, of uh, uh, behaviorals that uh, help us uh, uh, to increase awareness and improve uh, uh, in the culture. And uh, if we are talking about uh, uh, inclusion, uh, for us in AstraZeneca, it is a behavioral. Uh, we appreciate uh, individuals uh, for who they are. Uh, if we are talking about diversity, for us it is a fact. And uh, that means uh, that uh, different backgrounds, thought, ideas, uh, ways of working, uh, cultures and generation uh, will drive uh, innovation and uh, will lead uh, our company to, to success. And of course, uh, speak up, uh, for us, it means that as a company, we, uh, we, we provide mechanism uh, in which employees uh, can confidently raise concerns related IND. And also we have some processes uh, in place uh, which enable disciplinary uh, action to be taken if, uh, if necessary. And of course, uh, uh, and of course, uh, we understand that our uh, that our inclusive uh, leadership uh, is about uh, willing, seeking, leveraging our difference to achieve our company goals. And uh, we understand that uh, everyone have different ways of working. Uh, it does not matter who you are, it does not matter which uh, career levels uh, you have. Uh, our inclusive leadership is about uh, contributing uh, to a safe environment, demonstrating open mind, uh, active listening in transparent decision making. And uh, to support our IND culture, as you can see on the slide, we uh, developed, uh, I would say, <laughs> lots of activities that help us uh, build inclusive culture. These activities are not only global, but also you can see uh, lo local activities. Uh, for example, to promote uh, equity, we promoted uh, equity via awareness campaign. Or for example, we, uh, we uh, raise awareness uh, on, uh, we raise awareness on, um, inclusion via micro learnings. Also, we have different uh, kind of development programs which helps uh, our employees uh, to try something new, to use the experience in other, in the other fields. So this is like a cross-functional collaboration who leads also in success. And also, I think uh, one of the best and bright example uh, of initiatives if, uh, is uh, Power Diversity Week that was conducted uh, for Russia and Eurasia region. region. And uh, during this week, we uh, had lots of serious events uh, uh, related to inclusion and diversity. For example, we have uh, really very impressive discussion with our business leaders from Russia, and from Russia uh, which uh, who, who uh, increase awareness on, on uh, inclusion and diversity. Uh, all employees can ask questions, receive uh, one-time answer for their questions. So it was a very interesting uh, uh, session. Also, uh, we have uh, numbering uh, workshops. Uh, also, 
related to IND topics. And uh, uh, of course, uh, just to be sure that all our employees uh, know uh, what it is, uh, uh, what inclusion diversity means, uh, we provided micro learnings uh, for them. And uh, I think that, um, uh, how to say, I can say that uh, our employees, uh, they value our efforts. And uh, on the slide, you can see our uh, internal survey results. This is a result is for all employees across, uh, across AstraZeneca, but these results are related to Russian market. And as you can see, uh, all, all, all the aspects are around uh, 90%. So we can say that uh, all our activities, initiatives, they make sense, they attract uh, our employees and they know uh, what it is, the inclusion and diversity at AstraZeneca. I think it's all from my side. Uh, if you want any, if we need any questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be some and uh... We are actually building uh, a list of questions that are coming in on the chat. Um, I would just uh, um, encourage our audience to uh, go ahead and add questions. You can either make them general questions to the um, panel, or you can direct them uh, to specific speakers. And once we're at the end of the uh, presentations, we'll then uh, get to those questions. Thank you very much indeed, Irina. Thank you. Um, now, I guess, uh, if we could move to Irina Moleva uh, from BAT. Um, I was demonstrating a product earlier, but I, I won't now. Um, uh, over to you, Irina. Okay, thank you so much, Stuart. So, guys, hopefully you still have a lot of passion to go through our agenda, and I would make sure that I would stick to... Uh, 10 minutes, and then we discuss the outstanding questions uh, in the interactive part of the session. Can you see my slide, please? Uh, it is actually flashing. I don't know if you could just move it from that first slide to the next one. Let's see if it settles down. It's so excited, it's flashing around. Now it seems to have settled okay. down. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That, that's really great. And I didn't want to move to the next slide because I wanted to pay your attention to... Uh, the name of my position, and it says HR and Inclusion Director. And inclusion uh, has a big stress here. And you, you may say, like, what is changing when you change the title? And uh, does it matter at all? I would say that it does matter for me personally, because I am on my mission to make sure that we drive inclusion and diversity agenda in the company, in the organization where I represent uh, HR function. So uh, before we move on, what I wanted to uh, just uh, show as an introduction uh, to the audience uh, on the call. In March 2020, BAT announced a new corporate strategy, and I really believe it sounds exciting, a better tomorrow. Thinking about the product and the impact of our business, it's about reducing the health and environment business. But if we talk even broader, what does it mean? It is a better tomorrow for consumers, of course, a greater choice, a greater variety of products, including less risky products. It's also better for society, a better tomorrow for shareholders, employees. And uh, our diversity and inclusion agenda is basically a big, big, big mission inside of our purpose, uh, a better tomorrow. And I wouldn't be Honestly, I want to just read out uh, the words of our CEO uh, because I, I believe that it reflects DNI peace very, very vividly. I truly believe that having a supportive, engaging, and inclusive culture that treats everyone equally while embracing our differences is fundamental to our business and its continued growth into the future. And it really resonates with me when I am reading this. And that's what I am using when we are talking about inclusion and diversity inside of our organization. 
Obviously, BAT did not start the DNI journey yesterday. There's uh, a long way here. However, last year, based on our a better tomorrow strategy, we reviewed our ambition and we made it much more ambitious actually. And now we are talking about uh, diversity of experience, which is very important. I would say that earlier, we've been mainly hiring either from tobacco industry or from FMCG companies. Now we want to look broader. We go agile, we go digital. Hence our ambition to double uh, the number of cross industry hires and we are on the way. It's also about gender diversity, obviously. Despite, we might think that there's a lot of progress there and you, I would show you in a, a minute uh, this thing. I still believe women deserve special attention when we are speaking about accelerating their careers. Also breaking the stereotypes, which uh, professions are female and which professions are male. And I think this agenda is still very, very active in Russia, should be very active in Russia. And we are also talking about spread of nationalities across uh, uh, our leadership teams. So what does it mean, like practically, uh, what's going on in BAT Russia? I will entertain you with a couple of photos and pictures, and I, I, I hope that it would touch you emotionally as well. Ten years ago, and I have a long history with BAT, so basically graduating from the university last century, end of last century, I joined BAT in Sarata. And at that point of time, we couldn't even foresee that 50% of BAT Russia top team could be women. And even more, the majority of the people that you see on the picture are Russian local talents that we grew throughout this long, long journey. And we are very proud of it. And today it is a reality that exactly 50 uh, the, this, you, you know, like a <laughs> balance 50-50 in the top team who are running the business and who are leading the organization. And what we are doing, uh, except for internal practices that are quite similar to the uh, previous uh, uh, speakers' examples, we put a lot of emphasis in social media because we want to be known for our diversity and inclusion agenda. And you can see uh, some pictures that are showing how we promote our uh, diversity and inclusion uh, strategy through the social media. We had a BAT Girl Digest where the ladies, uh, the employees of the company were sharing their experiences. What did they learn? What do they do? They were giving advice to the audience to show that if you are a female, you would be interested uh, to uh, join BAT because this is a company that is given, uh, giving equal rights. Uh, we uh, try to make sure that we uh, have this balance also longer term. So our programs for the fresh graduates or even students uh, are always uh, giving a chance for people to grow. And you can see that in our summer internship program last year, 68% uh, of summer interns were female. Sorry, guys, there is uh, some noise. Uh, yeah, could, could we check? Uh, could everybody who isn't speaking be on mute? Sure. And we have a fantastic global graduate programs. If I started my career again, I would probably definitely start my career through such a program. And you can see here that we have also quite a balance and bringing the future leaders into the organization, uh, both uh, female and male. I started to talk about, about breaking stereotypes. And uh, here there are just a few examples of this thing. Also through social media, we are promoting this thing that uh, actually the so let's say 
male skewed professions, occupations can be uh, female. And uh, you can see here a picture of our commercial director, Olga Rustamova, who is uh, leading uh, the trade organization, the sales of organization of uh, BAT Russia. Another examples could be taken through the, from the operations. Actually, the interesting thing is that four out of six production uh, managers in our St. Pete factory are females. Despite the, that we say operation or production or factory is not something for the females, but the things are possible if you grow the fundamentals, if you stick to uh, your DNI agenda. Uh, and one more thing that I wanted to highlight, and then in the discussion we can uh, touch upon other things, is that last year we started to pay significantly more attention engaging the candidates with disabilities. And uh, we really want to make an impact on our society, a positive impact on our society, giving more chances for the candidates with disabilities to join the company, to experience it. The first step was to work with the farms, the, with the partners who are supporting such people, to educate them, to run open days for them, to show what does it mean to work for the international company, to arrange uh, test interviews for them so that they could experience and that then get feedback and advice how to run uh, the interviews uh, better. And there, there are more examples there. And we uh, had uh, a, a few people joining us, uh, candidates with disabilities last year, and five times more people uh, joining this year. We are talking about 23 people for the moment, maybe not a huge thing, but a big step ahead in terms of positive impact on our society and helping giving the opportunities for the candidates with disabilities to grow and develop in the company. Here are a couple of achievements uh, that uh, we uh, participated and got awards in, Women Who Matters, Women in IT, Central Asia Women in Tech and Site. And uh, uh, you can see that we also try to be active, not only internally, but also externally, to make sure that we share our experience with the community and uh, we learn from each other. Basically, that's it in terms of my presentation. Looking forward to the next speaker uh, presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Again, I've got, uh, got some questions, uh, but I'm going to hold back. Um, so, uh, Sophia, if you would like to take the uh, stage, uh, the virtual stage, as it were. Stuart. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to present today what uh, DNI means for us at EY. I was actually quite excited to listen to previous speakers. I think in this field, you can never get from, from good, you get only to better, and you can always learn and understand some new things that you can implement in your own company. So I think there were some good definitions and slides shown today. I think I will just expand on this from where, you know, we are at EY, and then of course, like the previous speakers, I'll be very happy to take questions later on. So I think we all understand that DNA is not just about the ethical side, but it also now means it's the about efficiency of the company and sustainability of the business. And now that most of us live in a more global world, I mean, sometimes it doesn't feel so, but it, it is true. We need to take the best of the talent uh, geographically, culturally, um, and then gender-wise, of course. We also need to understand that we include different uh, voices and people of different backgrounds, ethnicity, religion. We also don't forget about people who might be impaired and were not part of the team at some point, but we can definitely benefit a lot from it. So EY is a international company. It's been, it has offices in many, many countries um, and employs every year thousands of people. 
we have some pockets where we start innovative cultures. And I have to say that our UKI practice is uh, quite advanced in that. So for example, they started um, hiring people with neurodiversity and uh, we now look at having the same and expanding in, in different parts of the world. Um, for example, looking at our best practices that come from Britain, we have started to employ people with disabilities in Russia, for example. So I think we definitely benefit from having a global outreach and learning from what are the best practices that are there. There's a lot of things that we have been doing, but we understand that only talking about is not enough. And of course, that's why you need a accountability framework because you do need to have certain KPIs in place. You do need to have certain trackers and assessments. And um, of course, um, you can't just forget about it because sometimes I see if you forget about things or when, for example, economic crisis happened and last year you might've seen some research uh, that COVID-19 actually did not do well for females because um, for many of them, it became quite stressful time. They had to take care of children, elderly parents, sometimes working at home and looking after both categories did not really help with their careers. And I think it put additional pressure on women. And I think that means that uh, a lot of advancement that was done in that field was kind of taken back. So you do a step forward and two back sometimes. So you do need to stay focused in that area. That's why five years ago, um, UI globally, we created a global diversity and inclusion committee, which I'm part of. I'm very proud of that fact. It's only um, about 50 partners from worldwide of different backgrounds, religiously, ethnically, geographically. And I think the idea is that it's a committee, so it's not um, a leadership group, but a committee that is chaired by our managing partner now. At the time when we set it up, he wasn't our managing partner. It was actually one of his ideas. And I'm happy that he stayed on as a chair, co-chair of that committee, even when he became the managing partner of UI. I fully believe that if it's a focus of the first person and the group of C-level, C-suite level, if it's the focus area of the board of directors, then there is change happening. I see when um, you know we need to focus and, and make leaders accountable for those changes. It helps when the leaders themselves, the leaders of organizations believe in that and actually are role modeling what they talk. So they talk, you know, they walk the talk because otherwise, um, you know, you say one thing, but as our surveys of employees definitely indicate, if you don't do what you talk about and they don't believe you're truthful, and there's definitely need for more truthful and um, empathy and of course, openness in, in that field. So we've created that committee. And I think the idea is that we lead and champion those uh, um, d &I ideas that the previous speakers were talking about. That we test strategies. We actually talk about what we need to do to close critical gaps. We also think about the best practices and what good would look like. So as part of that process, uh, a year ago, we uh, came up with DNI Tracker and Optimizer. That's an analytical tool that looks at several dimensions and it has the ability to add more than female or gender dimension because we want to understand where we are in different parts of the world. We are sensitive to cultural aspects in some countries as already Alvira mentioned in Russia, it is you have to be sensitive to local regulations and laws when you talk about LGBT plus. But we do want to have uh, global standards of what good looks like. We do want to understand what we need to measure and progress in that area. For example, in some parts of EY worlds, we have also race and ethnicity groups, and they also now are quite important on understanding what we need to do to support our black minority or Asian community. And then of course, we need to add new or maybe missing DNI dimensions. Uh, we need to understand how we can uh, support those who are underrepresented and to help the role models who visually support the underrepresented groups. I think that's also important. And I think, 
that has really helped us then to move to the level of um, starting an inclusive leadership training. Um, I think our colleagues uh, Nilever mentioned that, and I think most of international companies probably go through that process too. So uh, it's important that this training is available for all levels of employees, from an intern to um, a senior partner. It talks about inclusive uh, leadership styles, different behaviors. It has videos, quite interactive content. I think it's also important that people not only go through the training, they actually understand what those concepts mean. They see those behaviors and there were very interactive videos that they can watch, um, which actually appeals well to millennials who, I guess, learn in a bit of different format. I think that was taken well. It also raises um, questions. So I think it's also important, and uh, some previous colleagues mentioned, speakers mentioned that when you have a culture where people raise questions, uh, you, you need to have that freedom to say that. You have to have venues when you uh, talk about you know, what didn't work well, because uh, we are, of course, focusing on some best practices, but sometimes when you do exit interviews, that is also an important way to collect information of what went not so well and why is that person leaving? Because in many cases they leave their posts, they join the organization and you can do a lot to attract people, but they normally leave their bosses or people they work with and you need to understand how to fix that. And I think, um, you know, we have achieved a lot we can be proud of. We also uh, sponsor and conduct two um, entrepreneurial programs, one of which I look after, it's called Entrepreneurial Winning Women. And it's a program that is a program and a competition. I think that goes well with our motto of building a better working world, because I personally believe that you would can only fix your own organization. People go home at night and they actually meet people that may be different. They also may interact different um, you know, views from their near you know, circles, the business community. So it's our, I guess, task to change the way people think and, and to basically have more um, tolerance and acceptability for people who are different, who speak differently, and uh, to su provide support to female and minorities because um, then they would not only have a you know, good environment at their workplace, but they can also start changing how the society thinks and accepts. For example, we have done a lot in female leadership and, and Russia can be proud in many of the aspects um, you know, women do have uh, you know, probably quite a higher experience acceptability of uh, having leadership roles. If you compare a worldwide um, in Russia, there are a lot of women in, in top positions. Nevertheless, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we have to increase um, membership of uh, women and board of directors. We need to make sure that they are sitting at the places where decisions are made. And um, that's why um, we will be supporting a 30% club initiative, which has started originally in the UK um, to come and open uh, its Russian chapter. I think it's important that uh, we provide you know, traction around that. And it's not only about uh, having more women, it's having more diversity and inclusion at the board level, in the top management, because that's where decisions are made. And I remember listening to different interesting speakers, um, how sometimes if you don't even take into account the fact that a lot of buyers and, and decision makers of, who are buying your product could be females now, they have a lot more earning power, a lot more financial um, capacity, and you don't take into account their views or you know who you, you target your products to, then uh, you could miss on that opportunity even as a business. So I remember listening to one of the VPs of Google who was in the development stages of producing Google Glasses. And in his group, there were no females. And at some point they had a woman join the group who then mentioned to them that their glasses were not comfortable when you have long hair, it kind of gets stuck in it. And he had that stage, he had an aha moment because as all fully male team, 
I never appreciated that fact or even thought about it. So you only know what you know. You only see what you have from your background and, and the set of stereotypes, and we all have them. Um, but unless you listen to different uh, viewpoints, unless you uh, include different team members in your team, you would not come up with a different outcome or would not arrive at a change. So there are a lot of assumptions that we might have from the way we were brought up, but um, we could never assume we know everything and we understand how some of the groups who are maybe not represented or um, who are not coming from your full majority feel, unless you actually have a way for them to have their representatives on the decision-making bodies, you conduct, um, you know, research and uh, surveys to understand what needs to be done to improve their well-being. And I think we have, um, it's great that you have this uh, conference today. I'm very happy to be here. And I think we need to definitely have such dialogues and interesting speakers to basically get it out there, understand what needs to be done. How do we close those gaps that uh, we have? And uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, they might have, um, come back to haunt us. So thank you. I will be happy to take answer, some questions later in the Q&A. Stuart, back to you. Uh, thanks, Sophia. I, I, you know, as you were saying that, I was just thinking, yes, uh, there's so much of the, the way that our lives have changed and our work practices have changed. And some of the things have been very positive and some of the things have been very challenging and uh, very challenging. And, and I think uh, we, we, need to uh, remember because there's a lot of you know buzz around oh you know zoom meetings are so much more efficient and so forth but at the end of the day obviously there are other the other darker side of that is um, that it puts so much pressure uh, into the home environment that that's bound to you know have an impact as well um so tomorrow let's move uh, finally to you and uh, your presentation and then we can get into the questions yay it's always uh not very easy to be a last speaker, so I'll try to be very precise, though I like to talk, so sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Stuart, please feel free to stop me if I'm uh, too much. <laughs> All right, so uh, All right. <laughs> my name is Tamara Zentner. Um, I decided to actually present myself for mm -hmm. the last two years saying, I'm this Asian girl from Russia with a German last name, which means 100 kilograms. That way people actually remember me. Um, so I've been with Shell for 14 years, uh, doing various HR roles, and half of the time I um, was an M, a DNI focal point. Well, simply because I'm the Asian girl from Russia with a German last name, I've been raising bilingual kids, a working mom. Um, I also happen to have um, very close um, friends from LGBT+, so I really know how difficult it is for them to actually live in Russia. So I really had no choice that uh, it would be a, a DNI focal point because it's a very passionate uh, topic for me. Um, because of the time constraints and because I'm the last speaker, I'm not going to show any slides uh, and to, sh uh, to share what Shell does in terms of ZNI. Because if you're interested, we have everything on our website. Yeah, and, and trust me, we also do, as many of the other companies, we do a lot uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion. So I was thinking, if I'll show you some of the uh, good results which we're proud of, then people would be probably interested, okay, but what were the obstacles, right? Or was it easy? What was it difficult? So I decided to be a bit risky and vulnerable, and I'm going to go straight to the obstacles and the difficulties. Not because I want to show that uh, my colleagues and myself are not that good, but just to show that this is a part of the process, yeah? And uh, we all should learn on uh, our mistakes, maybe, yeah? And at the end of the day, we did achieve results. Uh, but the path wasn't that nice and glossy. Yeah, it was actually bumpy. Um, and um, yeah, maybe it could help some of you um, on the start of the journey because I'm going to share how we launched uh, the Gender Balance uh, Initiative in, in Russia uh, four years ago. But I, I think, you know, the uh, some of the outcomes, yeah, and uh, advice I'll give there, they're actually... Um, applicable to any other uh, a process or, or a change, yeah? Okay, so the, I think that the morale of my story will be that, uh, yes, the path is not gonna be easy. 
but yes, people change. Yeah, but for that, you need to educate them. So four years ago, um, my boss came to me and said, hey, you're, HR, uh, you're DNI focal point. Uh, can you come to our leadership uh, team meeting uh, in Russia and tell them you know, more about uh, why do we need to have more uh, female on senior roles? I was like, easy, I'm DNI focal point. I run lots of sessions explaining how men and women are different, how you know, uh, females are better at multitasking and how they're more you know, about care and stuff. I was like, easy. Um, but important to know that at that time, I was also the person who kept on going back to our headquarters, telling them that, no, for International Women Days in Russia, we're not gonna participate in any of your movements because for us, it's about flowers and being pretty, you know, no, because culture was different. I was the same person who didn't really like uh, women network initiatives because I thought, oh, come on, really? You just need to work hard. So I thought that, I work hard, and went back home to my eight months old, and then I had to help to my uh, first grader with homework, and I had to cook and clean and, and work hard again, and then uh, make sure that my husband also gets some attention. Mm -hmm. So, and that person started to dig into why is that even, you know, an issue, yeah? Why do we need to have more women in uh, senior roles? So that time I find out about gender pay gap and about second shift, and somebody maybe from the uh, speakers, can you help me with what the second shift is? Yes, you know, of course everybody knows, I'm sure. It's about that first you work hard at work and then you have to go back home and you still have to clean and cook and take care and organize, etc. and nobody actually pays you, right? So yeah. that moment really changed my life because I went to that leadership meeting, changed person. So, there were four things which we did um, to kick out that whole process right. And again, I just showed you that that was the person who I was that time. Yeah, so, and whoever was there at the leadership team, they also now changed people as well. So what happened is that uh, first thing which really helped us to do it right is uh, senior sponsorship. So even though there was senior leadership, um, so it was, two women and about 10 men. Yes, who were the two women? HR. HR? Yes, and second one? Fi uh, finance. Yeah, not a finance, but it's usually it is. So for us, it was HSEC. Others were men, and also half of them were uh, expats, because at that time we believed that, or we didn't have um, you know, the experienced uh, local stuff. So I walked in there, <laughs> And what really helped, what was really important and makes a difference that our country chair was on board. He truly believed. So he was there and you could see when I shared the examples and tried to solve the story that yes, he believed in that. And he said, yes, we will do this. We should have more senior uh, leaders, um, senior women on, on the leadership. A second thing, of course, I had to share, uh, educate them, right? So I showed all the research and data that shows that the companies which have more women on board, et cetera, they'll make more money. It helped. But of course, they were thinking, yeah, okay, but we're energy company, you know, it's more like more men are engineers or, or we're in Russia, maybe it's not going to work like this, et cetera. So didn't really help. The third thing which we did, which moved a little bit further this journey was that we did pre-work. So prior to this meeting, we did a little survey with all the women in the office. And we basically just asked them, is there any uh, messages they want to share with their female, with their male colleagues? Yeah, most of them, of course, are uh, on our leaders. And what I did is I came out and show to our leadership the quotes which their female colleagues shared. And there were maybe some basic stuff like, for example, that as women, we don't really like that at the meetings, you know, we're, we're the ones who had to write down, make the notes, oh, because, you know, our handwriting is pretty. Or is that, um, you know, we usually get interrupted more often, et cetera. Um, but because these were quotes, uh, it was hard not to believe, right? But you know what happened? My colleagues says, Really, do all women participate? Well, it's probably not from my department because in our team, you know, everybody treated you know, the same. Or 
they're like, no, but I would like to really know what they meant. So, you know, because it was hard to believe, they tried to find reasons to say that, no, probably something else. So in that moment, we brought a last four piece, which was even more uncomfortable. So we brought them the data and not some data from some McKenzie report or some other research, not from Global Shell. We brought the report, the data from our, from these uh, leadership team uh, teams. So basically, we showed the data looks great because we have 50 men and 50% women, all good. But actually, of course, as higher up we go, as less females they are. So the next thing we showed that, for example, uh, if we looked at the potential, so that time uh, we measured, we call it potential, but basically we looked at, we estimated, yeah, how far can employee grow at the moment uh, in, in the company. So we said, okay, look, it seems that we have more women uh, at middle management with a higher potential. Interesting, because when we actually look at senior uh, leaders, we found out that there were more men, sometimes with a lower potential than with women. And it was really stroking. And the reaction I got, no, that cannot be right. So they looked at me and said, no, your rate is wrong. And I know who I promote and I know, you know, how do I make a decision? This is mistakes. And then they said, okay, this is not my department. So there was so much of not believing in defense but it's again now I know it's, it's normal, right? It's a human reaction because we we, we didn't we didn't, never thought about these things. So after this meeting, there was even worse some of the things. For example, people started to call me feminist. That time I thought it's bad thing. Now <laughs> I'm truly happy says I am. But that time I was like, oh no, how am I going to live with that? Or people started to uh, tell me things like, oh, we hope they're not going to be targets. Yes, of course there were targets after that. Um, third thing, for example, when I took off my CNI hat, I put my recruiter hat, and I would come in to the uh, manager and say, hey, you know, how, how are we going to um, close this vacancy? And somebody tell me, yeah, you're not going to show me just female candidate, are you? And I, I couldn't believe that is happening, right? But because we were launching and doing this, all these senior leader uh, trainings, and we put the KPIs and we make them accountable, yes? And we were, uh, you know, uh, supporting the women networks, doing all the right things. Now, four years later, in our leadership team, we have 50-50 men and women. More importantly, our new country chair is not only Russian, but also female. So, and nobody says any of this stuff anymore. So um, that's why I, I believe that it was, it was, Again, not pretty, a bit bumpy, but it was still good, the right thing to do. So um, just to finish, yeah, just to say that, yes, your CEO, your country chair, your senior management have to believe in this. For that, yes, you have to really educate them. This is not an HR game. When I walk into that meeting, first they thought, ah, it's an HR thing, this HR girl gonna sell us some stuff. It really helped that the country chair was in these boots and he said, no, we'll do this. This is not an HR thing. We have to educate our leaders. We have to educate yourself, yeah, because we change. Yes, and uh, as Sophia said, you have to make people accountable as well. It's not just a nice uh, talking, yeah. It has to be uh, real targets and plans and support programs and initiatives, etc. etc. Okay, also happy uh, to answer the questions and thank you. Thank you for a very spirited uh, presentation. <laughs> um, by the way, I, I have my uh, example of uh, inclusion uh, is um, uh, Masha Ivanova was a, a trainee of mine in 95 when I set up Citibank. Uh, Masha Ivanova is now the CEO of Citibank. Um, so uh, she, nothing to do with me, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it shows that, uh, uh, that there are uh, th this progression of uh, women in business um, going through the glass ceiling um, is, is definitely there. I mean, uh, and let me just just use that as a maybe a starting point for some questions. Um, you know, this thing of 50 50 is good. But then if you look, if you dig a little deeper and you say, well, where are the where, where are the women in, in organizations? Uh, 
you know, we've talked about the board and the fact that the boards um, uh, are definitely male dominated and actually sometimes wholly male. Um, uh, and also within the organizations themselves, you know, we may be able to point to a few examples of women as CEOs and actually I can think of quite a few now in the Russian environment. Um, but when you look generally across organizations, how do you make sure it's not just a numbers game of how many women are employed, but also take it to the next level and say how many, how many women are uh, employed in management roles or uh, uh, board roles? And can I just be the dinosaur and say, and how do you make sure that in this movement, you don't prevent um, uh, men with high levels of talent and experience from being put into those positions because you need to make room for women. Sorry, I realize that uh, this is definitely an old man perspective. So uh, whoever wants to answer that, let's see if we can get uh, that conversation going. Anybody want to jump in? That's George. Sorry. Can I can I answer? Yeah, that? yeah. Go ahead. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a constant challenge that I hear. You know, if you start promoting women, you will, you know, um, I guess step on the on the way of men. But I personally believe that when we talk about competency and uh, equal opportunities, then you give that equal opportunity, of course, to both sides of gender. And I think the idea of inclusive environment is not for full female dominance, which I hope we'll don't aim for, but it's to give the equal opportunity for talent, different genders. But of course, when um, quotas were introduced in some countries in Nordics and in France, there were questions about where, where would we find women? There are not enough women. Well, they found enough women and then they've abandoned those quotes because they were not necessary. So in order to, they don't have quotes for words anymore. And in fact, in France, they actually now um, have fines for those companies that have more women on board than men. You know? <laughs> and I think that should work this way too. You have, to, I think the, the sign of true equality is that if you have um, as many incompetent women in leadership roles as you have men, I'm joking. But I think to have a certain process where you achieve change, and sometimes it's with KPIs like quotas. I personally might not support them, but if you don't introduce some things, you don't achieve change. But when, when, when there are enough women on, on the board, then you, it stops being an issue. You, know, you don't need to have quotas. You don't need to, um, I guess, have the same... Um, you know, force with promoting female agenda. But until you achieve that, until you have people on, and until you actually have the data, like for example, equal pay out there, then, um, you know, you, you then can only say, okay, I've done this. But with any process in life, be it fitness, healthy lifestyle, if you, if you, <laughs> you know, lose your sight of that, you actually, in many cases, have a problem of falling back to the old bad habits. So I would say that it's good to promote women, but not at the expense of not promoting other talented people in the company. But sometimes change comes with certain pain, growing pains. <laughs> These are also necessary for changing the environment. Uh, good, uh, other comments? Stuart, yeah, if I may build on what Sophia said, I would say check for pain points and unconscious biases. Like in the examples that I was uh, giving a few years ago, when I would be talking about sales uh, or trade marketing, uh, my area managers would be saying, no, no, this is not a job for a female, too hard, they would not be able to cope, they have different priorities, usually this is what you will hear, right? And then you start working with their mindset and saying, are you sure? Don't you think that there could be different perspectives? And you start with small wins. You hire one territory manager representative 
uh, one salesperson, junior salesperson uh, as a female, and she proves that she, she, she is good. And, and then you, you build on, on this success. However, this ultimate point that we promote for the talent and for the potential and do it as objectively as possible should be staying within the company. So look at the areas where the pain point is, or where this balance is, is especially indicative. Challenge the business, ask them questions and put the plan in place to make it balanced. I, and by the way, I'm not saying like make more females, like in HR space, I challenge myself to bring more male for sure. And that's where my mission is. So uh, check for the pain points, work there, and always challenge their unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will add one small comment. I think it's very sad there is no one from L'Oreal here, because I know there they have versus diversity program where they have strategically put in like employer brand activities, uh, talent management uh, to grow man talent versus female talent. So this is like, I think each organization are looking for balance. This is the right word. Uh, we're not looking to like overcome uh, each gender or each type of them, uh, like diversity or of inclusion, same in disability. We want just to represent real people. We want to represent what is in the nation. And it can be only built not through equality, but through equity, which is like a new level that we also I recently discussed that we're giving extra support to people to have the same opportunities. Uh, and for women, we're not like pushing them up just in the sake of doing it. We're just giving them um, some support in that, like talent programs, awareness programs, building their like self-esteem and empowerment, uh, which uh, which historically wasn't there uh, due to like cultural and more bigger picture. Thank you. Just also would like to add, uh, colleagues, uh, there is no L'Oreal, but uh, here <laughs> we have AstraZeneca and actually in AstraZeneca around 80% of uh, um, Employees, not only uh, even in the manager's old, but overall it's a female because traditionally healthcare, it's, uh, uh, it's mostly fit uh, for uh, women. So we do not have special uh, programs for men, but uh, actually we have clear, uh, clear uh, job responsibilities. We have uh, clear, uh, I would say, selection process for all roles. So everyone have uh, uh, equal opportunities to, to, be, to be in AstraZeneca or to be manager or director as well. Uh, there is, of course, um, another class that needs to be looked at for inclusion. Uh, that is the class of older people who, uh, as they have uh, finished their career, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I don't know anybody that, that, that could fit this profile, but uh, no, I mean, on a serious note, the fact is that, that I think that there is uh, also out there uh, groups of people who have enormous experience who reach uh, the end of their um, normal careers, but who could be brought in to organizations, uh, not just at the board of director level, um, but uh, as senior advisors in different capacities so that people can access the experience that they've had. Um, I, I say that, of course, being an old man. Um, there is uh, uh, something that I wanted to pick up on, which um, actually came out of Elvira's uh, uh, commentary. Um, you know, you made, you made these, um, you, it was a very good presentation. And one of the things in there was, um, the effort to get inclusion into the supplier. Um, you know, that you're actually, you're not just looking at your own organization, you're, you're kind of pushing it down into the supplier. And the question that immediately came to my mind was, first of all, what is your leverage? Um, you know, how, how much you can actually really force the supplier um, to, to, to move in that direction. But then also, and I think this is very important, um, the uh, balance between profitability and long-term goal, uh, because you, you may be 
um, accepting something where you have a lower profit, but you, you are moving forward this agenda. And the trouble, of course, that I can imagine is that the shareholder uh, up at the ESG and in the float, you know, on the markets is saying, oh, we want ESG, we want inclusion, but keep the, the, the quarterly profit number, you know, where it should be. So you've got that sort of tension. I, I don't know if you'd like to, to comment on that. Yeah, I would love to comment on that. Um, like more as a HR person, I'm sure like procurement people can comment a bit better than I do. But uh, let me tell you from the like global overall perspective. If we're talking about diversity within the supplier, we maybe we can't push them to be diverse. Uh, we don't have like such a power, but we can choose diverse suppliers. Uh, for example, people from minority groups, small and medium-sized businesses who um, need uh, like support of the, our big companies to grow themselves. And globally, uh, from this year, they're starting to establish a big program where they will like calculate investments that were uh, investing in this type of suppliers. The economic model behind this is following that, um, of course, no one is going to like to choose a supplier just because of the sake of the diversity and forget about the cost. Uh, we know in our practice that usually smaller and medium-sized suppliers, because they're really passionate and want to work with us, they are open to the negotiations to have the same cost or even lower. Uh, plus, also these gives, give us a long time longevity because Unilever as a company would like to build a societies and people and economies so they can grow together with us. So if we want to support smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses, then how the overall economy will grow. If we're talking about uh, like the growth of GDP of the, of the countries, uh, of course, the big chunk is coming from the big companies like Unilever itself, but it's impossible without the good chunk of media size and small companies that we would like to invest in to look in the long term too. So there is a great, should be a great balance of the short term like margin issues and the long term um, investments that we're doing. And I think uh, this balance is what we're currently plan to achieve. Other comments on that, anybody? Um, this this balance, because I, you know, having run businesses, uh, you, you get these the, the problem that you get, and I think it's it's an you know it's it's work in progress. The problem you get is you get some senior guy um, who has a ta who or woman who has a title uh, that says you know they're responsible for this. They run around uh, saying this is very important, uh, but they're not connected in any way to the line manager. And the line managers there saying, you know, show me your bottom line. And these other influencers are saying, well, no, you should be, you know, following this this um, this other route. And I and then just uh, looping this back into a comment that that was made, which is, you know, you need to get the most senior management on board with this because if you don't get them on board with this, they can't drive these um, initiatives through uh, and and make it possible for people to actually go ahead and make these long-term versus short-term um, uh, decisions. So I, I, I certainly think that's one part of it. And I think another part of it is how to, so, and I just imagine, you know, people who have the responsibility of improving this, being in organizations where the CEO um, hasn't bought off on this. And then you've got the old traditional problem, how do you manage upwards? Um, and I, I think I'm not sure, and, and I'm going to the stream of consciousness, and then thinking about the Russian uh, leadership style, which is still authoritarian, um, getting somebody in that position of authority to buy off from below is, is very complex. And I, I suppose what I, I would say here is that we in Russia are now seeing ESG coming forward as a major topic. Um, and they're talking about issuing the ESG bonds, and it's now being widely discussed. And so hopefully this will then change the perception of these issues at a senior level, which will then have a, a positive knock on uh, impact. Um, any, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on my rant, but um, I, I've got two um, uh, questions, which I actually think I'm, I'm just going to um, uh, 
read directly um, because they're very good questions. Promotions shall be based on competences only and not gender. I would be insulted if it was otherwise, but it is important to provide women with such an environment that she has time and energy to build these competences. I mainly mean here the fact that in our society, not only in Russia, it is still expected that women take care of the family and children. Uh, that's the first point that Julie Max has made. And the second point that she's, oh, hang on. Uh, and the second point she's made is in the panel, is it indicative that everybody on the panel uh, is a woman uh, properly dri and that they are properly driving this discussion? We need more men in senior roles to drive this in business practices, uh, and, and ex for example, rather than KPI compliance. So I think those are two very um, good comments. Anybody have a comment on those? Well, I think there's some very important questions. And I do, I do agree that you can't only include more women on boards, but you also would benefit from men also supporting this agenda because um, while we achieve certain we achieve certain gender parity, you know, it will take some time. And, and that's also not the aim, as I mentioned, to only have female only boards. So the idea is to educate um, all of us in what is the stereotypes and what um, the inclusive culture would mean for the company and, and for the shareholders and for all stakeholders uh, of um, this company. But at the same time, as I also, when I was talking about EY, if you don't have leaders, male leaders who support this uh, DNI culture, then you wouldn't have a lot of change. So all the mentorship and sponsorship programs, um, they only work if you have uh, men in decision-making um, positions supporting the agenda. So it is important. So those processes, they have to happen at the same time. And yes, while I agree that um, you wouldn't want to include gender in promoting people, at the same time, with any KPIs, with also people with different types of impairments or any other distinctive and different um, features, if you don't understand who they are and if you don't understand how to promote them, by having a set of KPIs, you wouldn't achieve a difference. So if you only employ people from the same university with the same background, the tendency is to hire people like you, to promote people like you, it's normal. It's human tendency to like people who are similar to us. So if we talk about making company more sustainable and, and more efficient and productive by having different people on, on your team, then you have to make an effort to hire people who are different from you. <laughs> And that is a real effort. It doesn't happen overnight. I think even for the most advanced people in this field, I sometimes hear stereotypical things out of their mouth because it's normal, we're humans. And um, unless you have someone who will tell you, well, you just said something that doesn't make sense because um, you would not do and make any difference. For example, when we talk about uh, some of the um, racial incidents in the Asian community that is happening because of COVID and the Black Lives Matters, I mean, I heard perspective from some of my uh, American colleagues who say, well, what you say, yes, it's your perspective, but you were never judged on the color of your skin or the way you look when you enter the room. So how can you assume you know what I feel like when I enter the room and people grab their wallets because I, I'm Black? I mean, this is an important point to understand and appreciate that uh, we talk from one perspective, but if you never encountered that type of treatment, you can never, <laughs> you can never say for those people who feel that way, you can never assume you understand how they feel. So that was, um, in all of my years in this field, that was quite um, a revealing conversation and I'm happy I had it. I think it only makes me a better person. Yeah, good point. Um, I have another comment here, um, or question. Um, are there any indications of uh, DNI programs, uh, what the financial impact is? I think I saw some studies somewhere that said, you know, companies, public companies with women on the board have better profitability levels 
than those with just men. But I, I don't know, any of you know the answer, the direct answer on that? Have there been studies? Hey, it's a good, it's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'm also very curious because I just wrote a comment. I know about general studies, as you also mentioned, but I never heard that someone within the company, uh, like some d team or HR team or finance team, uh, put an effort to build some kind of financial model. I think that's very, very um, complex and time consuming and very difficult. So if someone within like representative within the chat or panelist, it would be great if you something well, I, 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 yeah go ahead sorry again yeah, sorry to interrupt. We have done um, calculations on the engagement index so if you have more engaged employees how much effect it would have on your gross margin and I would have uh, um, you know we'll probably expand into the because we have uh, we are now implementing DNI tracker and optimizer we'll probably expand in there because I would assume that having a culture that promotes and gives equal opportunities would mean more engagement and would mean more margin. But at this stage, I don't have a study to support that, but at least that's my assumption because those pockets of excellence where we did connect higher engagement indexes to better economics, they actually do correspond. So there is definitely a correlation between more engaged employees and their output effectively um, supports that concept. So. Uh, I think that um, uh, actually I do think there's uh, studies somewhere somewhere out there and and maybe we at RBCC can take it on ourselves to sort of Google and see if we can't uh, circulate it to to you. Um, I've certainly seen somewhere uh, an analysis that was done on publicly traded companies. Um, and I think that uh, this will only increase I, I, given that the ESG has become the, you know, the, the, the trendy topic, um, I think a lot of people are going to be looking to try and bolster it with uh, factual um, re uh, reviews. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure there's some very smart PhD student that's, um, you know, been hard at work on this. So, so let's see if we sure, can... Uh, maybe I would yeah. just uh, throw one thing that I was uh, studying very recently. It uh, was Accenture study of 2018 where they said that the diverse company or the companies that are putting a lot of emphasis on diversity and inclusion are showing 28% higher revenues, uh, double net income and 30% higher margins. So th these are statistical facts, right? So, and I'm pretty sure that the audience can find many more examples that are proving the correlation between the focus on diversity and inclusion and uh, better business performance. Thank you, thank you. Even though I'm, I'm not meant to acknowledge Accenture as a source of wisdom, but you know, that's okay. Um, I, I've got a, another topic here, which I, I think is an interesting one, and I'm just gonna read it out uh, from Olga Gagarina. Uh, a question to all speakers. In your knowledge experience, are there options for undergraduate education programs in gender or women or diversity or ethnic equality studies in the CIS and the region, or rather the inclusiveness awareness education is available as part of a more general business and HR management post-secondary program and employer specific corporate training, i.e. can a youth in the represented, well, in the countries here represented, uh, choose and study towards a career in diversity and inclusiveness. Uh, the question is asked from a Canadian international education and immigrant agency perspective. I think that's a really interesting question because, you know, if I was watching this and I was look, thinking about my career and I was a man, um, I, I might well think of this as a, an interesting opportunity. Does anybody have experience with this? Anybody seen this sort of an education program out there? Uh, I think um, as, as a person who worked some time in employer branding with, um, with the graduates in Russia, uh, as I know, we don't have this kind of specific programs on gender studies versus our Western colleagues. We have uh, the sociology, um, like, um, like a degree, 
where partially they cover uh, gender studies and other sociological studies. Uh, and there is some people who like specify their like education there, but we don't have like any, like, because we have a different, a bit different education system in uh, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. So we don't have any like specification only on that. Usually who finish, people who finish sociology as, uh, as a degree, um, can go and pursue like different careers, including in like our organizations like HR, since seems for me the most like suitable from the first glance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that seems like a plan. It, it does, I mean, it's the sort of thing we, we work closely with Skolkova, so we might, um, we might throw that question at them. I, I, I do think um, given that it's, out there so much this is something that that should be um should be investigated um any other comments on that yes i also uh, would like to add that that why it is very important uh, uh, us as a company to to increase awareness on these topics to provide materials uh, to conduct work- workshops in terms of i, I don't know even um, in terms of uh, uh, gender or uh, in terms of, I don't know, equity. This is why we are here, that why uh, HR and the other um, financial, I don't know who else, uh, they pay attention on these uh, very important topics because we have, to under- we have to increase awareness, we have to educate and we are responsible for creating this culture. Can I, can I also add? So yeah, I'm pretty sure there's nothing in as a real uh, you know, degree in, in Russia. Um, but for example, I am sure all the companies are so in Shell, we have our DNI certification. Yeah, it's not in Russia, it's globally, but it exists. And um, for example, if we took for SHRM, uh, yeah, HR uh, certification, um, they are provided here in Russia who are certified and one of the modules would be a DNI. But it's just a certification. Of course, it's not a, a full graduate. So. Right. Um, I'm I'm just prodding my uh, my handler in RBCC to check if if there's other questions that have come up. But I, I you know we're um, we're getting towards the end of our time allocation. Um, I it, do, do any of the panel want to ask any of the other panel with it? Sorry, does anybody within the panel want to ask a question of somebody who is also on the panel? Stuart, can I, I'm, I'm not uh, part of the panel, I was the introducer, but can I um, ask a question which uh, I saw in the chat, so it's not my own, but I was going to ask one on similar lines because I thought it was quite interesting. Um, it is, um, how do you approach sensitive aspects of DNI, such as LGBT rights, um, which might not be actually recognised in the country you're operating, but which are very much part of your corporate values? And, and we've all talked about walking the walk. Um, I know there's legal uh, aspects to it, but um, I'd be very interested to, to hear your perspectives on that. Um, I, I wouldn't mind hearing Elvira and Tamara's uh, response to that, if, if I can put two of you on the spot. Thank you for putting us on the spot. <laughs> now, the reason why I didn't ask that question, Elf, is because I didn't want to put them on the spot. <laughs> ah, I'm a bit more blunt, I'm afraid. Yeah, uh, let me comment, uh, and let me comment. I would just want want to know. This is like my personal perspective, not the position of Unilever. Uh, just to be on the safe side of the things, um, as we know, the legislation in um, Russia, especially, uh, prohibits propaganda of. Um, homosexuality for underage people. The, the biggest thing is underage. And the Unilever as a company who has a lot of branding decided that our brands and our external messages due to local legislation won't have any, um, uh, any mentioning or any um, like correlations with LGBTQI only due to that. Um, within the internal thing, we have um, as I know a bit more space, and I know some companies who are already doing some communications there. 
uh, one thing that we are currently doing, we didn't have any communications, but we're building our plans and thinking about it. Uh, and what we're currently doing is number one, of course, check with your legal team and with your HR team, just to understand that everyone who will see this communication internally are not underage. That you don't have students, interns, like anyone who is not 18 years old. Other thing that we're like building is we want to have this communication in very like polite and tolerant form. So more like um, have it from the empathy standpoint. And we're thinking about connect it with some international days. For example, 17th of May was um, international day against um, uh, brutality and discrimination of homosexuality, LGBTQI plus community. Or in October, there will be national coming out day. So maybe if you would like to consider in your company, um, just to see this type of international days and have some kind of first settled communications uh, to build an empathy and awareness without saying which is wrong, what is right, you need to do this, you need to like change your uh, minds and perceptions because there is also some diversity in religious groups and everything. So um, my recommendation would first see no underage in your organization, have a settled, empathetic, uh, kind uh, communication as a first very beginning. Yeah. Any other yeah. comments? I'll, I'll share my view. So. In Shell, uh, of course, we really look carefully at the culture in the country. So when I was at the DNI internal training a few years ago in the head office, and um, you know, it's blended learning. We discuss you know different um, DNI aspects uh, you know, virtually, but for sexual orientation, we actually had to do face to face because indeed it's it's sensitive. And it was really interesting to see because the majority of the group were Europeans. And when we did the case studies, uh, for example, uh, okay, if uh, you are negotiating with a partner, uh, potential partner, partner say something anti-gay, for example, what is your response? And of course, my European colleague says, oh, that's it, we're not going to do business with them. And it was interesting because I was in the room and I say, yeah, not sure. <laughs> so, and then I say, you know, in some countries that is you cannot because that's the only way you could do business and then you cannot just close the door unless you really don't want to business. And of course, then we look at the map because you you know, Russia is not that bad in, in a way, right? Because there are you know, some Middle East countries when you really go to prison for that. So in Shell, we don't get pushed. Yeah, there's the things which may be culturally or legally not yet or not acceptable. So that's why we don't uh, really drive it here. Uh, in, in our offices, but what we, we do little steps anyways. Uh, for example, last year was the first year when, uh, uh, when we had an international coming out day and we did have um, back then in a rainbow colors on the website. So we did not put the big posters in the office because when I did talk to our call, to my colleagues, honestly, they were 50-50. Yeah, for half of the people, this is still not acceptable topic, yeah? So for others, they say, no, you know, it's absolutely fine. So we do in a tiny little steps, but we really measure if that's okay culturally yet or not. But only in Shell Russia, of course, not uh, in uh... Thank you. Sorry, but for, sorry for butting in there, Stuart, back to you. No, no, that's fine. I'm glad you asked the question. I didn't have the nerve to, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, I just make the comment that uh, when you operate in a country, the laws of that country, uh, uh, the, are the uh, you know the laws you have to follow, um, so uh, you have to work around that, and you have to, uh, as as our panelists have um, just indicated. Um, I, from my side, I and well, I, 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 I the question for the panelists to other panelists: Are there is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like um, to ask amongst yourselves, as it were? Okay. Um, I just thought I should ask that. Uh, it is nearly two hours. Um, I think that's a pretty good uh, wicket. Um, I, I think this has been a, a fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank all of the uh, panelists for each each one of them for bringing new issues and uh, and understanding to the topic. Um, and I'm sure that this is uh, we're going to see more of this. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on it. We'll probably do something 
on a regular basis to see how this, um, this is uh, proceeding. Um, Alf, I turn it back to you to uh, close the uh, seminar. Great. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for uh, moderating that so well, as always. Um, thank you to our speakers. Uh, just like to add to um, Stuart's words, absolutely fascinating topic. Uh, and the fact that the, the, the panel was all female was, I suppose, brought out one of the points that you made at the beginning about the sort of makeup of a lot of companies. So in, in a sense, that made the point very powerfully. Um, Elvira from Unilever, Irina Irmolova from BAT, Irina Shaprova from AstraZeneca, Tamara from Shell and Sophia from EY. Thank you very, very much for your uh, input there. Absolutely um, fascinating. What you, what, what only Irina will know, uh, sorry, what only um, Elvira will know is that we're actually running a survey in, in partnership with Unilever uh, in which we'll um, look at um, some of the issues covered today. And uh, once that uh, survey has been completed, we will look to share uh, the results with you and um, we'll, we'll keep you updated on that. I'll, I'll finish off by once again, thanking our sponsors, uh, Unilever, today's lead sponsor, BAT, Shell and AstraZeneca. And of course, thank you to the audience for joining today. I know you've all got very busy um, schedules and lives. Great to see you. Um, look forward to seeing you at our next event. All the details are on the website. But for now, thank you very much. And